Howdy, and welcome to Playing with Prologue. This week we're with Wouter Beak and discussing the semantic web. For those who are new to the semantic web, uh, why don't you explain a little of the basics of RDF and, and how the semantic web's put together? Yeah, sure. So RDF is, say, the underlying uh, data model of the semantic web. So this is an image from the RDF uh, primer, uh, the, the standard document that describes RDF. And it gives a very simple example of how the underlying data model of the semantic web looks like. So we see different nodes here. We see a person, Bob, and we see uh, the Mona Lisa, a piece of art. And they are two nodes in this semantic network. And you can also see that between those two nodes, there is a edge pointing. And the edge represents a relationship. It represents the relationship of Bob being interested in the Mona Lisa. Uh, you can also see some other nodes. Uh, there is Alice, which is a friend of Bob. And you can also see Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who was the creator, of course, of the Mona Lisa. Uh, what is also interesting about this picture, and very essential, of course, to the semantic web, is that the colors, they denote uh, that different people have made these assertions. So the blue facts that you see, uh, Bob is interested in the Mona Lisa, is asserted by uh, a blue agent or company, whereas the Mona Lisa was created by Leonardo da Vinci are created by the green uh, uh, authority or the green agent. And so people can actually extend each other's knowledge. So an encyclopedia might say, uh, this was created by da Vinci, and then a company might say, okay, this customer is interested in the Mona Lisa, so maybe he is also interested in uh, other products that relate to uh, the Mona Lisa. Um, this shows that the, the RDF data model is very easily extensible, so everybody can add an edge to this. So I can, for instance, add, uh, I think the Mona Lisa sucks. I always thought it was a little bit of a boring painting. I can just add my edge to this picture. And uh, this was very early on uh, in the creation of the semantic web. This was called triple uh, A, which stands for anybody can say anything about anything. So complete freedom, uh, as is ideally the case on the original web as well. But you can do some reasoning about these things. For example, if you say that Mona Lisa is a painting and paintings are works of art, then the Mona Lisa is a work of art. Yeah, indeed. So uh, the semantic web is actually, if you want to use its expressiveness, is actually quite expressive. So the logic that underlies uh, the semantic web is uh, description logics, uh, which are formalized in the OWL ontology language. And in that language, you can actually express uh, a, a lot of facts as long as they are still, say, computationally efficient to uh, derive you can still express them. And actually, the expressivity of uh, description logics is, uh, to some extent, comparable to uh, a prolog, to horn clause logic. The biggest difference is, of course, in horn clause logic prolog, we have the closed world assumption. So we can derive that something is, uh, is false just because we don't know it. So everything that we don't have in our database must be false. Whereas on the semantic web, there you have the open world assumption. So there you cannot infer that something is false just because it's not there. But other than that, uh, there is a large overlap in uh, expressivity between uh, horn clause logic slash prologue on the one hand and description logics on the other. There are a couple of, uh, of schemes for uh, making these assertions about other about other triples, uh, RDFS and OWL. Yeah, indeed. So RDF is only the basic structure of the graph, but there are other schemas that you can uh, additionally attach to your knowledge model that make it uh, stronger, that allow you to assert more things. And RDFS, indeed, is an extension of RDF that allows you to also assert the domain and range of a property, for instance. And it also allows you to assert uh, hierarchies, hierarchies of classes and hierarchies of properties. Uh, OWL is another schema uh, which further extends RDFS, 
And OWL is very strong because OWL is actually a full uh, description logic. Um, description logics are very expressive, but they are also still computationally efficient. So they are the best of both worlds, if you like. So, um, so how does all this relate to Prolog? Oh, well, that's an easy question. So uh, Prolog, I would say, especially SWI Prolog, is one of the most uh, well-developed uh, environments for writing semantic web applications in. Uh, the semantic web has a very difficult tie with uh, object-oriented programming, maybe for obvious reasons, because the semantic web has a declarative uh, data model. Uh, it also has a, a primary query language, uh, Sparkle, which is an SQL-based uh, query language, which is also declarative. So from the onset, the data model and also the query uh, language are much closer related to a declarative programming language like Prolog than to uh, popular, maybe more popular object-oriented paradigms. Um, then there's, of course, in the SWI context, uh, Jan Bielemaker, um, who has uh, developed uh, Cleopatria, which is a, a Prolog-based triple store where you can store uh, uh, RDF data. And this was built, I think Jan created this triple store some 10 years ago, so very early on. There were very few triple stores at the moment, uh, at that time, and uh, Cleopatria was actually uh, feature-wise, uh, maybe ahead of its time uh, back in the day. Uh, now, in uh, more recent years, we are focusing more on integrating uh, Cleopatria as a triple store with other data storage paradigms. So we have an integration now with uh, RocksDB, which is developed by uh, Facebook, um, which is a key value store, which allows you to store enormous amounts of data, but only key value pairs. So it's a very simple data model. But if you combine that with a triple store, it becomes very powerful. Uh, for instance, you can store an identity relation, which is huge. If you want to store it as a graph, you can actually very efficiently store that as a key value. Uh, yes. Another uh, a data model that we are integrating into um, the triple store paradigm is uh, HDT, which is a disk-based uh, way of storing RDF data. Uh, which also has huge potential because it allows you to uh, scale over disk, which means that you can just store the whole LOD cloud just on your hard disk in a single file. It's compressed, so the file is even very small. It's like gzip, but gzip for RDF data, and you can even query it. So it has sort of all of the perfect properties you would want in a file. You know, some people uh, come to... Uh like open data from the from uh, logic programming and are a little disappointed to find out how weak the uh, ability to infer is on the uh, uh, on the semantic web yeah so I, I think the problem when a, when a logic programmer uh, looks at the semantic web for the first time, they are probably uh, terrified by what they find there. So the problem with the semantic web is that it's a logic, so it's a formal logic just as what underlies Prolog, for instance, but it's also the web. And as we know, when we combine the web with something, it often goes out of hand. So look at what happens when we combine political argumentation with the web, for instance. So people start yelling at each other, they start uh, wishing each other to death and stuff like that. And this this is the same on the semantic web. The only difference is that now you also have the logic underlying this web discussion. So you get somebody asserting Donald Trump is uh, the best president ever and somebody else asserts that Donald Trump is the worst president ever and there we already have an inconsistency. So there are already the reasoners uh, get into trouble very well. Yeah. Who all is uh, publishing uh, LOD data? So there is this uh, famous picture in uh, the semantic web fields uh, called the LOD cloud picture. So this is an overview of linked open data. So this is only data that is published openly. This does not include data published by companies internally, obviously. Um, and each dot in this linked open data cloud is one data set. 
And you can also see that there are some clusters forming here. And the clusters are determined by how these linked open data sets link to each other. So how they reuse each other. Uh, to give an example, in the middle of the diagram, you can see there is one dot, one data set that is very connected with pretty much the rest of the cloud. And this is actually DBpedia, which is the semantic web version of Wikipedia. And because it's an encyclopedia, it contains many resources that other data sets can link to. So in an earlier example, you could link to the Mona Lisa, which is already in DBpedia. So you do not need to assert the Mona Lisa yourself. You can also see uh, colors forming. And those colors, they indicate different topics. So for instance, the huge red blob that you see, those are all data sets from the life sciences. And you can also see that they are very, very interconnected. So one data set may be about diseases and another one may be about uh, enzymes and another one may be about uh, genes and they all link to each other to explain certain interactions that are studied within the life sciences. Another interesting uh, group that you can identify here is uh, a governmental data sets, e-government. And you can see those at the top. Those are the, the yellow ones. And these are governments that are opening their data, showing their uh, citizens, uh, for instance, overviews about governmental spending. And this is also where uh, nice applications lie for data journalists, where they can actually uh, analyze uh, government spending and also keep the government in check. What is uh, the Lod Laundromat? The Lod Laundromat is an attempt to centralize the whole Lod Cloud, so the whole semantic web. The problem with the semantic web today is that it's spread out over thousands of servers, so there is no generic access point. You can compare it to the web in the 90s when there was not a centralized search index, so when there was no Google or no Bing. So you could not easily access the cloud of uh, hypermedia documents. And in the same way today, you cannot easily access the lot cloud, so you cannot easily access all the data. And that is why in LOD Laundromat, we centralize everything so that you can easily find data from one location. Why is it called the Lod Laundromat? Ah, the Laundromat is a metaphor we use for the task of data cleaning. So the problem with the semantic web is that the data is extremely dirty. So dirty that you actually cannot do anything with it as an application programmer. So in order to actually use semantic web data, you first have to go through a very long process of data cleaning. And the Lot Laundromat automates this uh, task of data cleaning. So in the same way in which laundromats and washing machines have made it easier for, for us to uh, clean our clothes, in the same way Lot Laundromat is making it easier to uh, clean the data. So um, this has always been an issue is, is that I, when I'm traversing this graph, I don't want to be making millions of uh, HTTP requests. Uh, so, um, so having having the whole whole uh, LOD cloud on in one big file. Uh, how big is this file? It's indeed strange that the people who created the Semantic Web Vision originally, like this includes Tim Berners-Lee, who also created the World Wide Web, they did not think about this. They did not think about, oh, so an agent is going to traverse this worldwide graph of data. And is then indeed, as you already indicated, going to perform hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of HTTP requests, which are, of course, denial of service attacks on the face of it. So will be immediately blocked. And somehow nobody ever thought this was a big problem. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. Having a cache, uh, like a local cache on, on file is much better. So we're now in the uh, free university server on an SSD disk because SSD is very fast. So it makes querying uh, very fast as well. And I do, I use LS to Take a look at this file over here. Oh my goodness. So 304 gigs uh, uh, is enough for the whole whole uh, LOD web. 
That's pretty that amazing. Is, yeah, it, it's not the full LOD cloud. So uh, the picture that I showed earlier is actually a little bit bigger. But this is a very big subset of it. And it includes over 28 billion unique statements. So from the perspective of Prolog, this file includes, uh, say, uh, 28 billion unique uh, facts. So as you can see, the file extension uh, of this file is uh, HDT, which stands for Header Dictionary Triples. And this was a file format that was invented by uh, Javier Fernandez, one of my uh, colleagues who works in um, uh, Vienna. And uh, this HDT file, when you open it the first time, it creates this second file that you see underneath it, which is HDT.index. So this is creating an efficient index over the HDT data file. And if you sum these two files together, you get approximately uh, half a terabyte of, uh, of files on disk. And of course, with SWI Prolog, we can also query those. So I start uh, uh, Prolog. I need a, a library for that, of course. So uh, we have uh, semantic web libraries in Prolog. I've created an RDF command line interface to make it a little bit easier to interact with these big HTTP files. In order to um, obtain access to a specific file, I first have to uh, initialize it from within uh, Prolog. So I can just uh, mention this file name and then say I want to store this in the default graph. Now the default graph is going to be the graph, if you don't specify a graph specifically, we're just going to query this huge LOD file. So let's see how that goes. And as you notice, it actually takes a few seconds to load this huge file. So it's a memory mapped file, and it's going to map, I think, 3% of the size of the file is mapped into memory, uh, which amounts to approximately 16 gigabytes, I believe. But other than that, you don't use any memory for this. So unlike a triple store, this is very hardware efficient. I can then... Uh, say I'm interested in uh, a statement, um, SPO, which stands for subject, predicate, object. This is the, the triple uh, format that uh, 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 the triple format that's used in RDF. And then I get one RDF triple back, so one uh, uh, assertion, actually. You see, this is the subject term, so it's a little bit strange subject term, but this is the web, right? So we're going to have a lot of very strange facts. So this seems to be bands and artists, A-H-A. -A. This is the, the predicate term, denoting the property, the target property, apparently. And this is a very long object term, as you can see. Wow. This does not look like very interesting data, so let's give a more... Uh, a real world example. Let's say we're interested in um, uh, Amsterdam. So now I'm asking for things about Amsterdam because Amsterdam is in the subject position, and then I have a predicate and an object. And then I get Amsterdam uh, is a populated place with an area of 219. And this is one of the very nice things about. Uh, linked open data, I believe, is that not only do you get this 219, but you also get what it is. So it's square kilometers. Uh, very relevant, of course, also for people in the US who often would calculate this as uh, miles, probably, or something uh, something else than yeah. kilometers. Acres. We actually yeah, use absolutely. acres. <laughs> <laughs> and so this also allows the, uh, the interchange of data in such a way that it's actually easy to interpret what it means. Normally speaking, you need a lot of domain knowledge to interpret what the number 219 means, but now you actually know that it means square kilometers. And can now enumerate other facts about Amsterdam. So uh, I can also uh, extract that the, the metro area is actually much wider than the uh, area of the... So the area is 219, but the larger metro area is 1815. And I can also extract other facts. Uh, there's also a, 
if I would not ask for statement, but for statements, like plural, uh, I get uh, statements about Amsterdam. Hey, I think it's interesting that uh, uh, two different sources have given slightly different sizes for the area. Oh, yeah, there we go. So now we already see this um, uh, uh, plurality of voices on the semantic <laughs> web. It led to uh, either inconsistent knowledge or knowledge that was asserted in different contexts. So maybe these facts were asserted at different points in time. But the problem is, of course, because the paradigm is subject, predicate, object, there is no way of recording the context in which a fact was asserted. And this often leads to inconsistencies. Right. Uh, or, or here it's also um, resolution. This is just uh, uh, 219 is a perfectly reasonable answer for the size. But 219.33 is simply more accurate. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So these two probably denote somewhat the same thing. But then this thing over here, I'm not sure whether this is uh, trustworthy or not. And so what oftentimes what we do, which is something that is more uh, going into the research topic, sometimes we say when a fact occurs more times, so when, uh, say, 10 sources say the area of Amsterdam is 219, then we say it's correct. And when only one data source says that it's 130, we say, well, maybe we do not believe that one outlier. So maybe we believe the fact that is asserted more often, um, which is, of course, not always the case. Yeah, because the, the sources may be simply copying each other or, or all repeating the same incorrect. Uh, That's true. So now we have fake knowledge, actually. This is a problem on the semantic web today, is that because people are copying each other's data, uh, sometimes a fact seems trustworthy, but it's actually not. And this is actually very difficult also to figure out. It's a very active uh, research field to figure out which data is correct and which data is incorrect. And this may be there just to, uh, um, to uh, obfuscate the facts. There's a lot of exciting things going on, and I... Uh, uh... Is this something that uh, our viewers can participate in? How can people help out? The Prolog community is a community that is uh, working at the forefront of where the semantic web is currently heading. Um, we have this huge copy of the semantic web. So we can do now analyses. We can perform analyses and also maybe build applications that not that many other uh, development platforms can create. So I think it's a very uh, nice environment to uh, to collaborate in. If you're interested in that, uh, let me uh, briefly show you uh, our work is, of course, uh, um, uh, available at uh, lodlondromat.org, uh, lodlondromat.org, where you can also find uh, the data that we have cleaned. Uh, but where you can also find pointers to uh, research literature and also to the code, so to the prologue code that allows all of this to run. Um, we're also available on, uh, on GitHub, so uh, all of the code is there, published as open source, of course, uh, at uh, github.com slash LOD hyphen laundromat. So if you feel like uh, helping out on a cool uh, prologue, uh, a project um, just uh, uh, open an issue uh, about something that you think is interesting in one of these repositories or just uh, send me an email uh, you can also find my email address on these websites so um, yeah it's very cool uh, topic to uh, do some prologue hacking on I think well this has been an amazing uh, uh, conversation with uh, Walter Beek uh, about linked open data uh, thank you very much, Walter. Thank you for inviting me on uh, playing with Prolog, and uh, see you soon on either the Prolog IRC channel or Swish, where Prologers hang out and exchange cool hacks. <laughs> yes, and we'll see you all on playing with Prolog. Please like and subscribe.